<laughs> On behalf of the College of Education here at Zion University, it's a pleasure to invite colleagues and visitors from other institutions to the talk this afternoon by Professor Mary Kalansis and Professor Bill Cope, who I'm sure you're all aware are global we renowned for their research and publications in areas such as multiliteracies, new literacies, uh, e-learning, um, and on and on and on and on. So um, it's a real honor and a privilege for us to host them and have them here for their talk on big data and the implications of big data for research, for assessment, and for learning. So without further ado, over to Professor Mary first, and then after Professor Bill. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for turning up to hear us talk today. It's a real privilege and my honor that you are interested. Um, I'm going to do a little introduction, uh, and Bill is going to give the talk. And actually, what we're going to do now with you is kind of share with you the latest work we've done. We're Australians, you can tell by our accent. And 10 years ago, we were recruited from the University of Illinois, essentially because it had the resources to do the kind of work we wanted to do, which required technology, right? Required a computer scientists, required engineers. Not that we didn't have them in Australia, but you know, in Australia, you get a grant of $150,000 over three years, and you think it's Christmas. Whereas in America, <laughs> we've been able to secure the resources to share with you what Bill is going to talk about. And of course, it took us into, once you start investigating what technology, the e-ecologies e for learning, it takes you into a different domain, which impacts on your research, impacts on the way you think of the world, and he's going to share that. But by way of introduction, just in case some of you don't know of our work, we spent 30 years of our lives really preparing teachers, <laughs> educators, uh, uh, around curriculum issues, pedagogy, uh, literacy, that's what we did uh, in collaboration with others. We are team players, we're working teams, uh, the new world requires that of all of us. It's impossible to achieve and solve the kinds of problems we have without the inter genuine interdisciplinarity that um, teamwork brings. So just very quickly, because Bill's not going to talk about this part, he's just going to show you the new tools and the implications of the new tools that we've invented in, in Illinois. But when we worked the latest, 20 years ago now, but one of the significant things that we did was run a multiliteracies project, which was a, an aggregation of what the group that got together thought was important for the future, which is already here. <laughs> but at that time, time, we had a bit of money and well, we got some folks together in New London, in New Hampshire, in America, because it's cheaper to bring people from the US and from England and from Australia there rather than bring them all to Australia. So we ended up uh, in New London, which was a little um, town that caught me cast and found a cheap hotel for us to spend the time together that we were working in. We thought it was ironic to call ourselves the New London group, but that's what we did. But we did that because we wanted to solve a big problem together, and that is that all of us were working and publishing, uh, trying to make a difference in the world, and what we could see is that the gap between those who were achieving and those who weren't achieving in our schools and our universities Universities was getting bigger rather than smaller, despite everything we were doing. So we thought if we left our egos at the door, left our names at the door, and got together and said, well, what makes a difference? What is it that you need in order to be what the Europeans call it, a good citizen worker learner, an effective citizen learner worker? And the three things we came up, and I'm going to say this quickly, because these three things are embedded in the tools that Bill is going to describe. And because he's going to talk about other elements of it, uh, I wanted to, um, just those of you who know the work, just kind of recap. But the first thing, of course, is a word that is kind of misused, and used a lot, and that's diversity. You know, in every classroom, in every learning environment, every learner, as you know, is unique. Um, Carl Wyman, who's a physicist, a Nobel Prize winning physicist in the United States, you might know of him, but he's also an educator, he says he knows all the contextual uh, uh, um, components of splitting an atom, right? Complex. Splitting an atom is a complex thing. But transforming a lot of the contextual issues are even more complicated and more unpredictable than splitting an atom. You know, did they have breakfast? You know, are their families fighting? You know, do they have the language? If you know 
the contextual issues are very critical. So diversity in its complex sense is really important to us as educators, not as a feel good, not as a political correct thing, it's the reality of what we need to deal with. Sometimes we call it now personalized learning or differentiation, you know, we understand that if we want to engage and transform a learner, we have to know who they are and we have to be able to, there is no best answer that is for everybody and for the lot. So that's the first point I want to make. And so do we have the capacity to do that? When I used to go to classrooms and say that to one teacher with 20 kids, I felt terrible because how were they going to respond to that? Like the technology of the classroom and the resources they had made it impossible, right? But we used to go in and tell them they had it on. And I had really no idea. But that's the first point. The second point, of course, is we looked around at how meaning making was made. And I'm going to say this very quickly. There's one revolutionary thing that's happened. Then, of course, there is multilingualism and, and multiple dialects and now the internet and different kinds of ways of making meaning. But even then, we were, had a sense that something dramatic was happening with the new digital technology uh, that was producing the capacity for multimodality. Because now, we can use devices that can integrate audio, visual, any symbolic thing. But it really is the manufacturing of meaning used to take different expertise. So the printers, the photographers, the audio people. But in the digital world, you get click. You get all those things, right? Are we preparing all learners to understand how to invent and create multimodal meanings? Or are they just haphazardly sticky taping things together? So more recently, Cambridge University Press has asked us to write an elaborate grammar for that area. Right, we don't, because we have grammars for symbolic uh, meaning making and alphabetical literacies. But how do we combine the visual, visual and the audio? How do we combine uh, text and other modes? How do we operate on any kind of device? And how do we make meaning in the, in the, in the moment when power has shifted from text to visual? And text is visual too. Uh, and I said this in, in, in um, I say this for dramatic purposes, just to bring the point home. But you know the prison in Abu Ghraib in Iraq? The Red Cross had written in perfect alphabetical English a tome about the atrocities in that prison. It was on the internet, available to everybody. Lawyers, prime ministers, governors, presidents. Nobody took any, pro uh, uh, any, any uh, notice. But somebody took this, went in, went snap. <coughs> Do you remember the picture? The man with the hood? and all the electricity <coughs> being tortured, that one picture right, had an impact on the world. The power of the visual now is absolutely phenomenal. So that's what we were trying to, to talk about with the concept of multimodality, how uh, meaning is designed, etc. The third point, and I, I'll finish on this point, is the most important one. And it's very difficult because people talk about instructional sequences. Instructional sequences can be just busy work. <laughs> just can keep a classroom occupied. Pedagogy really matters. And there are different fashions and modalities within pedagogy. And what an educator needs to do is expand their repertoire to know a range of pedagogies, to know which one is appropriate for you, or you, or for all of you, or for this discipline, or for that purpose. And pedagogy had, although we understood it, had gone back on the back burner, or we chose one, which we thought was the one that we had to go in Despite multimodality, despite um, you know, differentiation, this was the one. But we know, and this is important for us, the only measure of our success, the only measure is the transformation of the learner. If we can track it, if we know what's happening, you know, when, and not when it's too late. When we give them a test at the end, it's too late for us to know what we've achieved. Right? We can pass some notes on to the next teacher. So they were the things that we were dealing with in preparing teaching. <coughs> and with the digital, we thought, what can we do in this space? And the first generation of technology was upload, download, traditional pedagogy. <laughs> Not much different. So we set ourselves the task in the United States at the University of Illinois where they invented, um, what was it called? The first... Uh, Plato, yes, <coughs> where they invented Plato, which was the very first uh, learning technology system. But because educators didn't participate, 
right? The engineers who did it then went on to do other things. And the educators said, oh, no, I actually found the people in America. I said, why didn't, why didn't you guys participate? And one of the most senior African-American um, educators said, well, African-Americans didn't have computers then, and so this wasn't for us. So it was an interesting kind of response. But educators didn't think it mattered to them. Okay? And, and still today, the one, the one um, barrier to creating the tools that we need to create for this moment, the barrier uh, uh, is the expert professor. <laughs> the successful, high-performing expert professor. Because they're good at what they do. So why would they do something else? So that leads me to Bill. <laughs> and he's going to share with, share with you what we've struggled to do in the United <coughs> States with the community and create these learning ecologies that embed what we'd learned over all those years, collaborating with us across those three domains. So, Bill. Okay, so that's a summary of a lot of work over a lot of time, some ideas. And this, in a way, is, um, as Mary said, some of the latest thinking we've been doing. And you've probably heard this phrase, big data, used a lot. I mean, when you have this phone in your pocket and it knows where you are and, and when you can navigate the world with GPS maps, um, that in fact you're embedded in this network uh, of computing devices where there's a lot of information about you. When I go to buy something on Amazon, um, it suggests a book that I should be buying on Amazon, and it's often right. I often buy the darn thing um, because it knows about me. It knows about my purchasing history. So we live in this world where there's huge amounts of data around us. Now, fast forward or move forward or move across to a classroom, and if you've got students working on any of these devices, like laptop devices, and soon, by the way, that'll be what students need to do nearly all the time, because you may need to look things up. They need to be, you know, you can't do on a piece of paper. You can't embed a video on a piece of paper, right? If I'm doing a science experiment, I need to be able to pull out my phone and take a little video which demonstrates what I did, right? So very soon, these devices, well, they're becoming ubiquitous very, very quickly, but the interesting thing about those devices, in the same way that information is being collected about me in my universe as I work and as I do things, um, these devices are capable and actually incidentally record everything that's going on, every keystroke, every answer, every move, clickstream data, which website I go to. Now, interestingly, this is the point where you can see what everyone, every student is doing. If they're clicking on the wrong thing, you've got a record of what they did. It's a kind of system of... Uh, surveillance as well, but also it's a system where there are new responsibilities involved. Now what I'm going to do in this presentation is refer back to some of the points Mary made about diversity and about um, uh, um, you know, uh, multimodality, refer, refer back to those points. But I'm going to try to talk at two levels. One's a pretty abstract level and a pretty general level, but also I'm going to give some very, very concrete examples of how this fundamentally transforms what assessment is. And I'll tell you my punchline. My punchline is, it's the, actually the end of assessment. It's the end of the distinction between instruction and assessment, because everything you do in instruction involves feedback loops, something I'm going to call recursive feedback. And you don't need this strange artifact at the end because you actually have a record of everything that was done. Right? It's, it's like a version of continuous assessment, if you like, that old-fashioned idea. So. But also what it does, it fundamentally disrupts what we do as educators, as uh, research people. So to give you an example, what we used to do is get a sample of kids and have an experimental group and a control group. Um, we have people who are working with the university. Our university has um, 44,000 students on the campus, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is we have 2 million MOOC students. And what we have is we don't have to take a sample of those students and have a control group, an experiment group, because we can look at what two million students are doing simultaneously. There's no difference between, there's nothing, sample sizes of God. We don't need sample sizes because N equals all. Okay? So what we can do is we can look at a whole data, and then what we can do is we can take an A group and a B group and do something slightly different with them and see what happens, which is kind of, it's actually the research methodology that Facebook and Twitter use for introducing new features. So. I've told you what the answer is at the end of the punchline is just so you can anticipate where I'm going. And what I want to do is now go through that argument in some degree of detail. 
My apologies for this screen, by the way. For the you people at the back, it's a postage stamp. Um, so what I'll do is... Um, Can you turn the lights off, please? Oh, no, is it clear enough? Maybe it's clear enough. It's actually, it's okay. It's okay, all right. What I'll do is I'll also leave this PowerPoint, but also there's a, a journal article version of this paper. I'm going to start with a technical definition of what big data means in education. Um, and there are four components. Firstly, the incidental recording of everything. So in other words, when kids are working on bits of paper, the things get lost, they're ephemeral. We're incidentally recording everything that goes on. But what's interesting also is we have very varied types of data in here, complex data, a click that they've taken to a website, a move in a game, a piece of writing they're doing where they put some keystrokes in, an item-based test. These are fundamentally, it's complex variable data, and in fact one of the interesting things about this big data universe is the capacity to deal with complex variable data. It's accessible, it's not that hard to get to. If you can't get to it, it's because the technologists haven't let you get to it for some reason or another. Um, it's durable, it can stay forever, it costs nothing to keep it, so you can keep a whole student's everything they do for, the, for years and years and years in these spaces. Um, but also, um, it's open to various forms of analytics, visualisations which tell you what learners are doing. So this is a, a kind of a technical definition of what this environment means for education. There's a reference here if you want to read a, a, a journal article version of this talk, what I'm giving, the, the part of the talk I'm giving now. This was published last year in ARA Open. But also, Mary and I have done this somewhat more accessible book just recently as well, which goes through some of these ideas if you're interested in a kind of a reference e-learning ecologies. And to summarise this book, just in one slide before I get into more detail about the data issues, that what we've done, and Mary said this at the beginning, what we've done in education, the first generation of technologies took old-fashioned artifacts, turned a textbook into an e-textbook, turned an item-based test into computer adaptive testing, turned a syllabus into Moodle and Blackboard. So what we did in, you know, in this first generation of technologies, which are now 20-something years old, actually Plato, the thing that Mary, the world's first e-learning system, which was created at the University of Illinois, was begun in 1959, so it's actually been a, a long time. But the generation from the mid-90s that we're working with now simply reproduced traditional classrooms, and we did not need to do that. Maybe we need to do it at first to get used to it, but our research question is, how can we do things which are very interestingly different? And this is our little map of seven different things. Firstly, multimodal meeting, the science experiment, which includes a video. Um, Secondly, recursive feedback, which is, is feedback which is all the time coming back to the student and feedback on feedback. And I'm going to show you some examples of that at the moment. So not the test at the end. You know, traditional feedback is I do a semester of work and I get the answer back, it's B plus and I'm a bad person. What do I do with that? It doesn't help me. It just tells me I'd better become better by next semester. Um, collaborative intelligence. You know, the classic metaphor of learning is the individual, whereas these can be very collaborative environments in ways that I will illustrate. Metacognition, we're not just doing the subject. In a number of ways, we end up having to think about how we take responsibility for doing the subject around self-regulation uh, and, and, and the like. Differentiated learning, the difference point that Mary made, which is about the possibility of having a group in a class like this, 50 people, all doing different things. It's manageable. It was never manageable before, but all of a sudden it is. Ubiquitous learning, which means we don't have to be together. We can do it in class, but also we don't have to do it in class. And the learning relationships are the same, no matter what. And active knowledge making, positioning students as producers of meaning. The textbook was about summarising the world of reading in the classroom and you that were then a passive recipient of knowledge. Well, build the knowledge, research things, write the chapter of the textbook and don't just, don't just read it. So this is, these are some ideas where I think we have opportunities to do a next generation of learning. What we've done in education, you know, the basic forms of modern education were invented in the mid-19th century and we've been doing the same thing for the last 150 years. This is an opportunity to do something which is very, very different. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a concrete example of this. And Mary mentioned the fact that we've been very fortunate to get a series of grants. These are our benefactors on the right, the US Department of Education on the top right, the Gates Foundation, which are the new Medici's, the, the new <laughs> rulers that give out money and if you behave yourself and do it the way they want you to do it, they'll be happy with you. And the, the National Science Foundation. So we've been lucky to do this and in fact, 
you know, just to give you a sense of the scale of it, we've been working on this particular set of projects for the last um, six or seven years, and it's been many millions of dollars worth of grants. So we've just been lucky to be in a situation, you know, coming from the activities down near the South Pole, um, um, we've been privileged to be able to be in an environment where we can apply for grants like this in the now, I'm going to give two examples of how this big data stuff will work. And I'm going to start with, um, uh, my first example is something that I call classroom discourse. Now, back in the 1970s, Courtney Kasdan, a professor at Harvard for many years, and one of our members of the New London Group, um, she wrote a, um, a very important book called Classroom Discourse. So what the teacher does is the teacher speaks and the students respond. And there's a classic pattern in classroom discourse which she summarises as I-R-E. Initiate, right? I'm going to ask you a question. The first question is, what's the furthest planet in the solar system? Okay? Then respond. Someone puts up their hand and they say, it's Pluto. And I say, yes, my evaluation is, yes, that's correct. So this pattern of discourse is a classic teacher-student pattern of discourse, right? Now, um, so what I want to do is I want to talk about the way in which digital environments prof um, extend and profoundly change that pattern of discourse. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give um, an example from our Scholar platform. And I'm afraid this is just a screenshot and it's um, <coughs> invisible down the back, so not to worry. Um, um, what I will also do, by the way, which I didn't do yesterday, but some, you know, Kay and um, Anna suggested I might do it now, is we use this environment for our master's students as well, and I'll show you what they were doing yesterday, literally. But this is just a screenshot of a student um, of a class, all right? So this is a, a class, and it looks like a social media stream where the classroom discourse happens. So we have community admins, not teachers, and we have members of the group. This is, um, um, and what they're doing is they're talking about ordinary people who lead extraordinary lives. The teacher posted this, a video, there's a picture of Rosa Parks, and the students are about to write a biography. They're about to, they're in grade seven or eight, and they're about to write a biography. But they start talking about how ordinary people might become extraordinary. So here are the students putting in their little comments in something which is a bit like um, Facebook and Twitter. So it's a social media feed. Um, and uh, let me go on now. I scroll all the way down to the bottom in this, in this particular example. These are the students. And you see how they're talking to at Hester, at Hester, at Yimbo, at Sh Shelby, and they're about to write a comment and they press that little add comment button. Okay? Classroom discourse? Yes. Okay. But also, this is how it's profoundly different. Firstly, here's a revolutionary change. I can say to everybody, you must all respond. Right? So classically in classroom discourse, only one person can respond. And you know my theory? My theory is the person who responds is always the wrong person. Right? Um, um, and the people who need to respond are probably, their minds are wandering and it's boring just to listen to an answer um, and so on. Um, the, the, the second thing is lower barriers to response, which is the people who should be responding, as opposed to the wrong person who did respond, right? When they come down here to this add comment part, they type in their, their comment, and they can see other comments coming in along the way. And they've got, if it's live in a classroom, they've got seconds before they, they press the add comment button. And they can think about it a little bit, and they can shape their ideas. They can get a little bit of confidence because they can see what other people are thinking. So that's the, that's the next one. Um, it's a shift from the oral to the written. So in other words, what we're doing is we're getting a thought which is a little bit more uh, finally thought through, less redundancy, and one of the bits of the linguistics work that Mary and I have done is about the profoundly different grammars of orality and literacy, and fundamentally the grammar of academic work is the grammar of literacy, and if we're shifting students in that direction, that's a good thing. But the next thing is, when everyone responds, learner differences will become visible and valuable. So you know my trick question about Pluto? Well, it's not a straightforward answer. So classical classroom discourse anticipates a single answer um, where the, the, you know, you're supposed to guess what's in the teacher's mind and the person answering has to be the proxy for a single answer. But when everyone answers, in fact, it's a bit problematic. Pluto may, might not be a planet and there might be other things which are planets as well. And we can start talking to each other 
and, and nothing, everything in the world becomes slightly more uh, nuanced, a little bit um, different. It's highly engaging. It's really boring just to listen to somebody else giving an answer because don't forget, one person's answering and the other 30 or whatever the number is are just sitting and listening. In social media, we're used to a high level of intensity, so there are actually 30 answers which I have to speed read. And I've got used to speed reading these things, and that's part of the skill. So this is engaging. And also, the other thing about it is when somebody responds to your response, there's the stickiness. I mean, social media, the, the, the metaphor that's used about what keeps us in social media is stickiness, which is the, the reciprocities that go on in that kind of dialogue. <coughs> there are no reciprocities in classical classroom discourse, and not of the same order. Uh, the rewrite mix of participation is about right. So for most students in the class, most of the time they are listening. Here we've built a balance, an equal amount of, about equal time for read and write, in terms of that kind of logic. We can break out of the four walls of the classroom. Classical classroom discourse, we've got to be within these four walls and we've got to be at this time. Confinements of time and space. We can do this conversation in the classroom and it's great to do it because we can talk over it and in fact the nice thing is I can talk to Anna and then I can talk to you all at once even though you're not sitting beside me and it's not chaos. Um, or we can do it overnight, it makes no difference. Um, um, anyone can be an initiator as well. Um, it doesn't mean that the teacher is just initiating a response. But my last point, and this is really the point about the, um, the big data regime, this is the really important point, is there's a new transparency. So we know whether you're thinking or not. We know what you're saying. And by the way, we can even use various machine logics to compare the prompt at the top with your response. We can measure your response, how many words, how much time you spent on it. So we've got a running record of everything that happened. This is a highly collaborative environment and we have a running record of the conversations in that collaborative environment. So we can actually apply learning analytics to this in a way that wasn't possible in the past. So that's the, my first of two examples. <laughs> my second example is this. This is classical assessment, yes? If people see this image, it's a kind of been a meme on the web. <laughs> this is real, by the way. This is a, this is a, I think it's in Thailand. It's a test of in Thailand. But it's a kind of an allegory for, for what we mean about knowledge in these environments. It's an allegory for that. In other words, A, it's blinkered off. It's my own personal stuff. It's what, what's between the <coughs> two ears. Um, uh, but also, it's what I can remember. Now, why do we need to remember much when I've got the phone in my pocket and I'm constantly looking it up? I mean, what, what does memory mean in the 21st century? We're in the middle of a revolution. Memory is about our, our, our capacity to use these things that Mary and I call cognitive prostheses. <laughs> right? These are our mental third legs, you know. So in other words, why, 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 why do we value memory work anymore? I mean, this is a very big change that's, that's going on at the moment. So what I want to do is I want to use that as a counterpoint to the scholar environment, where what students are doing is they're now doing a project, right? So this is um, project-based learning, if you like, 21st century style. And what um, they're going to be doing, remember that little prompt I saw about ordinary people and extraordinary lives? They're now going to start writing a biography, okay? And what they're going to do is they're going to write their biography, but we're going to give them an embedded rubric along the way. They're going to... Um, get feedback from two peers, could be three, whatever the number is. They're going to revise using the feedback of the rubric. They're going to write a self-review uh, along the way, and then they're going to publish that work to a portfolio. So I'm going to show you that happening now um, in this environment. And you'll, you might have noticed, or you might not have, the first space was called community, which is the classroom discourse space, and we're now in the second space called creator. And we have here uh, a multimodal editor where you can actually upload videos in line, you can upload audio, you can upload data sets, the whole point Mary made about multimodality. That stuff can all be um, uh, put in line and the description on the right is write a narrative about a historical person, choose the person and off you go. Now, I've written it and now I'm somebody different, the toolbar has gone and now what I've got in this environment, I've got someone else's text that I'm reviewing and over on this side against various rubric criteria, um, which I can open out, I'll show you these in a second, I can give it a score, I can write a comment. So in other words, what I've now given, the res I've given students the responsibility of assessing, um, assessing each other. 
And if I go on now, this is, I'm sorry, totally unreadable, but this is an expanded version of the rubric. If you open up those little arrows, this is what you see. So beginning exposition with a set of rating levels, um, um, setting exposition, um, main historical character, plot, complication, resolution, originality, writing, conventions, a classical rubric. And in fact, this is based on the US Common Core Standards. And the idea is let's rewrite the Common Core Standards for the students. And let's get the students to use the Common Core Standards to assess each other. But while they're writing, they see the rubric, which tells them what's expected along the way. Now, we get back the comments. This is an overall score on the right, a summary of the several people who reviewed this particular work. Um, and also what we can do is open out each person's review. So, in fact, I could see the name, but it was an anonymous review. And um, it, it goes straight to the point. And so we get a whole set of comments here along the way. Now, there's a number of very big shifts going on here between classical assessment and this. Firstly, we're asking the students to participate in the assessment process, and we're going to take their data seriously. And what our research shows is that the average results across two or three peers are pretty close to what an expert would say. So you average out things which are slightly anomalous, uh, the scores look about the same, but most importantly, I'm getting it in the middle of my work, not the end. I can see other people's work as I go along. So um, in a way, the point Mary made just, well, was making before was about you know the, the world of cheating. We're systematizing cheating, right? What we're doing is taking off those blinkers and allowing you to see other people's drafts along the way and to give them, in order to give them feedback, but we're going to know the extent to which your peers have actually given you useful feedback and you're going to own up to it. You're going to say, I took on board this feedback in the following kinds of ways. So we're going to build a collaborative knowledge culture where we know the provenance of every little piece because we're asking the students to be explicit about the way in which that collaborative environment um, has helped them. Uh, we also have um, this annotations area as well. So bits get highlighted and there are comments and we can have discussion backwards and forwards. Um, so the idea here is the feedback is you know, recursive. It can go around multiple, multiple cycles. Classic linear feedback is I do my course and at the end of the semester the answer is B+. Well, that's a linear process. Uh, this is a recursive process where there are lots of small bits of feedback coming in. Some of the feedback is human, but some of the feedback is machine feedback. So we built it with computer science, we built a thing here called a checker, which is not a grammar and spelling checker. It will suggest more complex expressions for simpler ones or simpler for more complex. Um, it's just something which provokes you to think about the writing that you're using in one way or another. And then what I can do is I can then write a self-review, which is, look, that bit of feedback from reviewer one was really helpful. Uh, reviewer two, look, I didn't quite agree with them. So you're writing a self-analysis of the kind of social contribution that's been going on in this project. And then finally, at the end, this is a, a, a real student's page. Um, there, she, these are the communities she belonged to. Uh, these are her peers. And this then is her, these then are her publications, her portfolio of works that have been produced um, in this environment. But, and, and this is kind of the, the overall model. So what we've got is we've got a lot of stuff happening here in classroom discourse on the left, um, in all the process of, of review along the, the right. We've actually got, um, even for one project, we've got thousands and thousands of small data points where we're picking up a picture of the student's work and her collaboration with the people around them. Uh, and this then, I've, this is a real class, so I've pushed out the names. Um, sorry, this is not very readable at all, but um, the various columns are the number of versions, average version length, academic language level, peer review rating, self-review rating, um, annotations made. So we have 20 different data types going on just in a project. And the interesting thing about this class is this class happened to be a school in uh, Wisconsin where Mary and I have been working, um, which has two halves. One half of the school is called the, uh, the legacy classrooms, which are conventional boxes, you know. And what they've been gradually doing is pulling down the walls and they've created another half of the school called Create. So teachers and students can opt to move out of legacy classrooms into Create. And there are 100 students in Create. So what Create involves is little 
round tables here, a little glass room there, a big open space. The teacher's office is right in the middle of the space, a glass room in the middle of the space. Um, there are multiple teachers moving around 100 students. Um, but in fact, this is 100 students all doing the same project and all peer reviewing each other's work. And it's possible at any one moment to see exactly where they're up to, to get a, a running score of what their, their grade is likely to be on this particular piece of work along the way. And that kind of logistical complexity wasn't possible before. So these kinds of technologies are making it possible to change the classic size of a classroom. It doesn't have to be 1 to 30. It can be 1 to 1 for a little moment, or 1 to 5 for another moment, and 1 to 100 in another moment. And there's a lot of moving backwards and forwards between those. Now, um, and what we can do is we can also dig down into every tiny thing that happens in a student's work. We can find one of the reviews, we can find all the versions, all the changes, so we can justify what our grading is. And the student can also see all of this as well. Now, what I want to mention to you now, just by way of concluding this little part, um, is um, this is something that we're building at the moment. It's just kind of a, a mock-up in our latest grant. Um, what we're building is we're building an area where the student can see their score building up all the time. So this particular student is doing an energy transformations project. And you can see here that they've got, they're building up these learning credits, okay? Um, so, the, so far there's 832 data points. What the teacher expected in this unit of work was respond to six teacher posts, create two posts, do two knowledge surveys which are like um, classic item-based um, things with open-ended answers or, or um, item-based answers. Um, do, do a project, write a project, do peer reviews, and make a community contribution. And each of these colours here shows how much you've done. And so an, the expectation is to reach a standard, you reach something called 100. An overachievement is called 101. And that's where you stop. Um, and what you can see, you can see, look, in fact, and by the way, the weighting of each activity which has been set by the teacher is the width on the, the, the map here. And we've got three clusters. One is a knowledge cluster, which is how much of that energy you've actually learnt. And we know that from peer reviews and from these little knowledge surveys you've done. Focus is how much effort you put into it, how much time you've been in there on the machine, how many words you've written, how many pieces of media you put in. But also we have this help section as well, which is the extent to which you've given meaningful and useful feedback to your peers and been part of a collaborative knowledge culture. And at any one point, when you start off, it's zero, um, and you can see how far you've gone. And our kind of idea behind this is the, the old-fashioned Benjamin Bloom idea from 50 years ago about mastery learning. If you make explicit the structures of assessment to learners and you give them access to all the data mining data along the way, um, as we're doing here, um, that's an incentive to get to the end. You know exactly where you are, and the answer is it doesn't ever have to be B+. Plus. It can be whatever is expected in this particular um, environment. The program measures this. Yeah. Uh, the program measures this. Yeah. Quantitative and also qualitative? Both, yep. Yeah. So you can dig down behind these. So for example, when you do a peer review rating, there is a score with a set of rating levels, but also there's a whole pile of qualitative comments that come with it as well. Self comments, teacher comments, peer comments. But what you can see from this, and this is a very new for us, because we were struck, and earlier what I will show you, you know, it was um, you know, particular points, but we want people to be collaborative. We value that. So if you value it, how do you measure it? Uh, we value uh, actually helping. We value that. And even on the MOOCs, the most powerful data that's come out of it is the P2P stuff. You know, that's where knowledge happens. People say, oh, MOOCs, waste of time, what's, you know, how do you know what's happening? How do you know if it's even them doing it? That's why that other part, focus matters. We have to know if you're in there. Time on task. What do you do? Yeah. Time on task. So we've tried to figure out how we can cap, given all the issues around new technology. But it does come back to the earlier point that we have a whole series of different data sources and in fact, we would, in one class, we've got these ten big data, tens of thousands of data points, which in a traditional classroom are lost to the teacher. But we can actually then present these as visualizations, as summaries. So I'm going to now just three really dense slides. I'm going to tell you roughly what's on them. And I'm going to leave the slides with you. And you can go and read the article if you're interested in the, 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 the complexities underneath it. Firstly, we built this topology of data. So what we have are these very, very different forms of data which are occurring in these e-learning environments. The minute you start using 
uh, any device for learning, um, you have these types of data. data. Firstly, there's a whole new generation of machine assessments, computer adaptive testing, natural language processing. We have a whole pile, a whole lot of structured embedded data, which are like games, intelligent tutors, rubric-based peer review and writing, and so on. Uh, we also have a lot of incidental, unstructured data, stuff that's called data exhaust, which is keystroke patterns, edit histories, clickstream, navigation paths. So in fact, we have an incredible amount of data coming out of these environments, and it's complexly different. It's very hard to make sense of it, and what we, well, what the task of educators now to do for these, these kinds of assessment is, is to make sense of them. Now, but what we also have is a very big shift in the assessment model. So again, there's a contrast between the traditional assessment model and the one on the right. I'll just mention a few points now um, in general um, um, terms. The first one was traditionally assessment was external. It was this strange artifact, you know, item-based test, a closed book essay, the blinkers on, um, so this is this strange thing which is not like learning, right? But what we have now is environments where assessment is integrally embedded into learning. It's part of learning and the distinction between assessment and instruction gets blurred. Um, we also have a shift in the focus from summative assessment to formative assessment. All summative assessment is is a retrospective view of what's happened in the learning environment. We also have a, dis a more distributed view of assessment. It's not just the teacher who does the assessing. It's peers who do the assessing, self-assessment, machine assessment. Yes, the teacher's still there, but in fact we have assessment coming from all kinds of angles being corroborated from one angle uh, and another. We have a shift away from individual memory being the exercise to looking at the artifacts. When I do a project, it's not what I've remembered. It's the collaborations that I've been part of. It's the research that I've done. It's the stuff that I've looked up. It's the stuff that I've found. I've actually built a piece of knowledge. And what we end up assessing is not how smart you are between your ears, but the knowledge artifact that you have produced. That's actually what we're assessing, which might be a science experiment write up. It might be a math problem where you explain your workings. There's all kinds of examples of that. Um, so there, that's just highlighting a few, um, a few points here. Then. For the research environment, again, I can just simply touch on some general ideas here, is the, the traditional uh, research model that we come in and we take a sample and we have an experimental group and a control group. Again, this is changing phenomenally because we've got these massive data sets where you can look at every single learner in this environment. Um, but also the interesting thing, and this is the point about diversity, what we did in traditional research environments was an exercise in averaging. If on average um, uh, this particular intervention produces results on average, well, it must be a good intervention. Well, in fact, what's really interesting in these environments is little groups of outliers. This little group of outliers comes up, and it looks like they're not doing well. We have to go and ask why. Um, this little group is doing very well, and why are they doing very well? So, in fact, we're able to pick up the diversity amongst learners in all sorts of um, kinds of ways. So, again, it's a complex argument, but I just wanted to give a sense that, I, that these kinds of environments profoundly disrupt traditional models of assessment and also profoundly disrupt uh, the research models that, we, that we've had in, uh, in education. So that's basically a very quick um, summary. Um, oh, don't, this is about educational science data structures. That's a, another whole um, argument. Um, this is just a couple more references of some work that Mary and I have done if you're interested in learning more about our general thinking. and. If you want to email us and get us some stuff. Um, and also do join. You can go to Scholar and set up an account for free. It's easy to do. Um, and we have a, a community in there called New Learning, which is like our kind of a blog environment. We also have a Facebook page and a, a Twitter handle as well. So that's a quick, um, a quick overview of um, the most recent view of our thinking. And we've still got six minutes. <laughs> so. Um Anybody like to ask a question? Shall we start here with Beth? Yeah. <clears throat> We're actually required to use Blackboard, then can we do the same kinds of data collection on no. Blackboard? No. The simple answer is Blackboard is a 20-year-old <laughs> technology, um, so, and it's also a 100-year-old pedagogy. So the 20-year-old technology is a hub-and-spoke model, upload-download, and it's not based on this peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So. Um, um, so the difference is the, mod, the, the underlying data model behind Blackboard is Microsoft SharePoint, 20, 25 years old. 
whereas what we've built is built on the same programming language that Twitter uses. So the answer is, and the artifacts then that are produced are not readily data mineable. So what we've done is we've built an environment which can be data mined. Now, having said that, you can put this inside Blackboard, and you can put Blackboard inside this. It's an outside normal thing. thing. Is um, Blackboard is a little strange, but yeah. you know, he's gone and talked to all these people. They can't shift because they've got a big market. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And you're stuck with what you have. But as Bill said, you can go across this the spectrum. Is this the only platform like its kind? Or are we going to be seeing more of this? I think we'll see more of them. And yeah. as I said, we've been lucky. We do education. We're interested in technology. And we've been very lucky to be working with some of the world's leading computer scientists at the University of Illinois. So I think we're going to see more of it. I can tell you fragments of this in other places. So I can tell you what how this is like Google Docs or Google Classroom, but also not. I've Googled Classroom as a whole long argument as to why it is problematic and doesn't work that well. But there, this is sort of like Google, Google Classroom in a way that Blackboard's not. It's also a bit like Edmodo in terms of the activity stream, which some of you might know. So this is a bit of, so there are fragments of this happening all around the place. Um, but um, but I think that our goal as researchers is not just to influence <coughs> you guys, <laughs> it's to influence those guys. And Bill has been working with very many different of these companies, sharing what we think as educators needs to go into those mm -hmm. platforms. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to shift them. It's but really, really it, it people would be them. people are welcome to use it um, uh, as well. Some of it is completely open, some bits are less open, and if you want access to the bits that are less open, you're welcome to use it, particularly if people are interested in doing collaborative research and research on these kinds of environments. I mean, our, our most important point is to try to show educators what is possible and to encourage them to move in that direction themselves, mm -hmm. right? And not to uh, believe that somehow this, the, the tools, which are, as I said, made by the entertainment and the business industry, uh, is all that's available. And we need educators to work collaboratively with engineers and computer scientists in their own places and push, push it, you know, push, push the direction to achieve the sorts of things we believe can be achieved in this space. So why do we talk? This is why we come and talk to people to try and influence one. Educators to be more optimistic about what's possible with the new technology, what the affordances are, and what we need to expect from the people who invent this stuff, and what we might be able to invent ourselves as well in different places. Barb? Um, you know, you're talking about the old styles of assessment, and you'd have the end of end of project quiz or exam, something that you have that one data point from your students, and you using this amazing technology, and you've got massive numbers of data points, right. huge amounts of data. Right. How do you how do you decide what's the important data? What how do you keep the balance between being completely overwhelmed with data right. and sorting out right. what's important right. to use, but not having enough on the other extreme? So um, this kind of scary thing is that project with a hundred students doing there in that class, there was half a million words of data there all over the place. So part of the part of the challenge and by the way, that data would have been there with 100 students doing handwritten projects as well, but just totally lost. Um, so the challenge is to build ways, you know, essentially building visualizations which present that data not just to the teacher but to the learner, right? So that that um, aster plot that I showed with the colours, that's actually the learner view, where they can see exactly what their score is given the teacher's expectations of the work that's to be done in terms of the amount of work, what they're to learn, and their collabor expectations around collaboration. So the teacher can actually vary all of that themselves depending on the mix that they want. So we don't want to be, we want to be pedagogically agnostic to allow the possibility of doing conventional transmission pedagogy in these kinds of environments as well. But also the possibility of expanding the range of things that are done. But the trick is not to be overwhelmed by data, which is to build these visualizations which are accessible um, to, um, to learners and to, um, to, to students. And you know, in a way, uh, to, to teachers. In a way, you know, the world's full of these things which are increasingly more you know, accessible. For example, you know, one interesting, one simple example which you may know of is this um, personal budgeting software called Mint which data mines all your bank accounts. So all you have to do is give all your bank account and credit card numbers to Mint 
and it brings you visualizations about what you're doing, which are elegant and beautiful and clear and obvious. Scary. And, scary. Scary. And, <laughs> and, scary. and frightening. That's right, terrifying. Just have all these red bars and you know, red circles and whatever. So that's part of... You spent more than you've earned. You spent more than you've earned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're now tyrannized by mint. So, but no, but interestingly, that it's becoming part of the culture to be able to, to, to use these visualizations to make sense of them and, and and part of our thing also is giving as much as as much control as possible to the learner right? it's not just secret knowledge of the teacher the knowledge the teacher has is of the whole group that's the only difference between the learner knowledge and the teacher knowledge is the the the, the, the you know you, you don't want the students seeing the whole group but but but, but um it's the same data and, and also it, it's not an either or right we are talking about learning in colleges in which this is a part of it's not that everything happens in this space, mm. right? Mm. Um, in the in this wonderful little school in, the, in Wisconsin, you know, where you have the legacy and the create. I mean, uh, you know, there's a, you know, there's theatre and play and, and conversation, and it's all that. It's human, like like I go, we go to so many schools, you feel you're going into prisons. You know, how can we do this to human beings? How can we do it to them? You know, I remember my mother, when, when we, she used to go look at our little kids at, at school, where my mother's a Greek background, she came from a village, and she used to come back and she say, they're hurting them. They're, they're making them sit on chairs, right? The idea that you had to sit on a chair for long periods of time, she just thought was anti-human. <laughs> but we train them. And the other thing we do is they come in synesthetic, they touch, they dance, they draw, and then we make sure that uh, step by step by step we take them only to alphabetical literacy or some symbolic and everything else gets stripped out. But like it's not human. There's, there's a very important segue though, which is that in fact if you've got these phones and you're doing a little dr dramatising something, take a little bit of video of it and then put it here, which is a record of what you did. You're going out on a science excursion into a park and looking at the vegetation in a park or some natural environment. Take the phone with you, uh, write things up, you know, um, some of the words it's, um, it, these become ways of connecting the material world with this documented digital world. The best example are all the Instagram food pictures. You know, the <laughs> pictures. You know we, we, this has become a ubiquitous thing now. So it's not as if the computer world is this mechanistic world separated from the world. It's actually a place where we can uh, document what we're learning in these vivid, multimodal kinds of ways. And uh, to go back to my example before Bill interrupted me. <laughs> uh, they're living experiences and well, and the teachers collaborate. You see, again, it's you can't do it with one teacher, 30 kids. So uh, even with computers in the room, it, it's very, very hard. In this space, teachers collab. Sometimes one teacher would, you know, they'd plan, you take the three, because these kids need extra, or something we'd be doing it together, or they'd all be doing it together and teachers were watching it. You need a different profession, you know, and you need to expand the repertoires, and you need teamwork amongst the, uh, the educators. Now, this little school's figured it out. They've done it. It's wonderful. They love coming to school. The kids love coming to school. The teachers feel like they're real professionals, right? Uh, and the legacy school, they're still doing exactly what they did, and the results are equally, you know, in, in, in uh, across the range, right? And you've got a very nice video of this school um, on our website too, where, you can see it. where the kids are talking and the teachers are talking. You can see this beautiful environment they've created. So, yeah. Okay, one more question, perhaps a final one yeah. from Bridget. It's very interesting, and thank you very much. And, uh, it's obvious that you're excited about some of that. And uh, all this uh, interaction and learning is changing, everything is changing. So should we expect uh, smarter students in the future? Better than us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yes, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's about relevance for the future. You know, uh, the future requires um, uh, not, not the individual making, you know, being an individual star, an individual performer, it needs collaboration. So you have to prepare them. It needs compromise, it needs negotiation. The kind of world we're moving into requires different kinds of skills. The skills that they're learning sitting up like that are the skills of passivity, which is allowing all sorts of things to happen now that shouldn't happen. So how do you prepare people to have agency? How do you prepare them to collaborate? How do you prepare them to understand the multimodality that's around them? It, when we started multiliteracies, we were predicting social futures, mm -hmm. right? And the education mm. system I, I we had was for time when people needed to be passive, mm. right? To do as they're told, to not to 
ignore their neighbour, to look after their own households, to you know, it was for a different moment. So, as educators, is that what we reproduce? Is that what we continue doing, or do we have to prepare them for a future where they can, their humanity matters, right? That the humanity matters, collaboration and sociality matters, and they have the skills to make it work. So that's the point. Actually, it, I'll, I'll sort of. I know we're getting, this is my last answer. Um, a very, very interesting piece of research by a New Zealand researcher by the name of Flynn. And this thing got called the Flynn effect. So the most stable tests in the universe over the last century are IQ tests. They essentially haven't changed. And one of the interesting things which undermines the very concept of IQ tests, by the way, this is what I like about it, is that if you look at IQ tests over 100 years, kids have got better and better and better at IQ tests. So the tests have stayed the same, Kids have got better and better at them. So yes, I think the generation who grow up being able to swipe these devices, uh, operate in these learning environments, will be much smarter. But the real challenge is this. What we've done with education is we have institutionalised inequality. And we've done that because um, uh, kids come into a class and we've got to put them across the distribution curve. So they've already been sorted out in one way or another by age or by... Um, Mary and I at the moment working in the medical school, these brilliant students who, come in, who get into the medical school at our university, and they've got to be put across a curve, you know, where some are really bright and some do well, a whole lot are mediocre and some are stupid, right? Because it's referential to that particular group. Well, to get in, you have to have a score which is highest right. in the now, country. Now, one of the arguments about mastery learning and making the assessment process very visible to learners, so that ASTA plot that I showed you, is that it's possible for every learner in a particular cohort to reach standard. Just be very explicit about what's expected and show them where they are at every point in time. And if they bail out at a certain point, it's their choice to have bailed out and not to have finished, or not to finish the program or not to have got a higher score. So one of the problems about our education systems is they are structured around systematising inequality, insisting on inequality. Why do we, as teachers, insist on inequality? So one of our arguments in, um, in this is uh, how can we build environments where, in fact, more students achieve the expected standard in a particular cohort? Uh, and, and the ideal would be everybody achieves standard. That won't happen. But the idea will be, instead of having a normal distribution curve like that, to push the curve over this way. That's a big agenda. Well, on that very, very positive note, again from the College of Education at Zayat University, really big thank you to Professor Bill Cope, to Professor Mary Kalantzis from the University of Illinois at the wonderfully bubbly name, Urbana Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great place to work. Um, thank you so much. It's been a really, really fascinating talk. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your passion, your expertise. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, everybody.